Again, my name is uh, Dr. George Walter Slayer. Welcome to the fourth discussion on Adam Smith's uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And you can visit my website, which is uh, georgewalterslayer.com and access uh, the, the uh, previous recordings on this. As indicated from the beginning, these uh, uh, discussions are about Adam Smith's notion of sympathy, social relationships uh, in civil society. It is not necessarily about morality, so to speak, but about social relationships and how public policies are formulated within the context of justice sympathy, kindness, passion for other people. So today we'll be looking at the, we'll be continuing the, the conversation from last week. So I will just share my screen, if you give me a moment. Let me look for my screen to share. Yeah, let me see, this is it. Let me put it in a slab mode so we can ha all have access to it. All right, so this is again about Adam Smith. I always give a little background. Uh, Adam Smith is a Scottish philosopher and his background was in moral philosophy, philosophy, logic, rhetoric, jurisprudence, economics, politics. And uh, there were influences in his life. Uh, he was a student of Glasgow, Oxford University, and Glasgow where he taught as well, um, and did a lot of work in Edinburgh, which is the city of uh, Scotland. His famous book uh, is the, the Wealth of Nations, The Wealth of Nations, which is uh, highly regarded by, by economists around the world. But today we're talking about his book, the, 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 the theory of moral sentiment. Uh, that's what we've been talking about, okay? Now the theory of moral sentiment, the book, it encompasses a tremendous range of themes disguised as a work of moral psychology. As a theory of moral sentiments alone, it's also a book about social organization, identity construction, normative standards, and the science of human behavior as a whole. Okay, so this is uh, Adam Smith. The beginning of the book, he, he gives a preposition. Okay, so this is the fundamental preposition here. The main thing, theme in the book, he says, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others. Okay, what leads people to be interested in the fortunes, in the problems, in the concerns of others. He says, there is something, no matter how selfish we can be. He says, I rendered the happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing in from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Of this kind is pity or compassion, the emotion which we feel for the misery of others when we either see it or are made to conceive it in a very lively manner, that we often derive sorrow from the sorrow of others. It's a matter of fact too often, too obvious to require any instances to prove it. But this sentiment, like all other original passions of human nature, is by no means confined to the virtual or 
or and human or humane, though they perhaps may feel it with the most exquisite sensibility. The greatest ruffian, the most hardened violator of the laws of society, is not altogether without it. So basically what he says is that there is something innate about us as human beings that want to sympathize with the plight of others, with the concerns and needs of other people. Uh, for the discussion, the themes for the discussion of discussion two was sympathy as the basis for moral action, passion as the foundation for, of sympathy, passion as the basis for judging others. That is, passion here is not this unbridled, uh, emotive expression of, of, of uh, uh, passion, but something that is built within the concern of others. Passion as an important social virtue, okay? But then he talks about passion as sociable and passion as unsociable. In discussion three, we have the following themes. Sympathy as the basis again for moral action. Imagination as the basis of sympathy. What he refers to imagination here is the ability to think about other people and to put yourself in that particular position. So you think, first of all, as human beings, so we think, and then we put ourselves in the position of others. And then we develop what he calls fellow feeling or fellow feelings. Fellow feelings are instances or sentiments of identification with the concerns and plight of other people. It's the extent to which, <clears throat> it's the extent to which we sympathize with other people. He calls that fellow feeling. But the absence of fellow feeling becomes problematic because he says, how can we live without exhibiting any sense of fellow feeling, without being concerned about the plight of other people? It is within that context, he argues, that uh, this notion of passion, this notion of passion becomes very important. So sympathy, he says, comes from our view of passion, from that of the situation which excites it. What is it that, that brings us to the place for us to identify with other people? Okay. Uh, in chapter three, he talks about the manner in which we judge the propriety or impropriety of an affection of other men or other people, but their concord or dissonance, dissonance with our own. So it has a lot to do with feelings, the extent to which we sympathize with other people, the concerns, okay, the extent to which we, we, we experience a kind of fellow feeling, a kind of connection with the person who is suffering. He says, when original passions of the person principally concern at imperfect concord with the sympathetic emotions of the spectator, they necessarily appear to this last just and proper and suitable to the object. And on the contrary, when upon bringing the case home to himself, he finds that they do not coincide with what he feels that necessarily appear to him unjust and improper. What he's saying here is that the extent to which we sympathize with people, that extent, that, that, that sympathy becomes personal, okay? And sometimes the extent to which we understand a person's problem does not register at all. It's the same way when you see a person crying and you hear that the person has, uh, is grieving the loss of the father, the loss of the mother, the loss of a relative. There is something he argues within us that sympathizes, that connects with the person because we think about ourselves. So it's on that basis, the basis of sympathy, the basis of passion, the basis of fellow feeling that he constructs his concept of justice. So the things we, de we dealt with uh, in discussion four were justice as kindness, the virtue of justice, equality is based on justice, not force, justice and mere justice, the utility of justice, injustice is destructive to society, justice is the greatest self-guard, safeguard, uh, what is justice for Adam Smith uh, discussion? 
So we, com we started this, however, we did not complete it, okay? For Adam Smith, it may be a bit simple for some who will say, but how can you say justice is, uh, uh, justice is kindness? Well, you must understand that his notion of justice is derived from this place where we sympathize with other people. You see, for him, <clears throat> justice is a form of, it's an expression of sympathizing or identifying with the plight of other people. He says, uh, justice is kindness. Action of a beneficent uh, tendency which proceeds from proper motives. Seems alone to require reward because such alone are the approved objects of gratitude <clears throat> or excites the sympathetic gratitude of the spectator. In actual fact, what he's talking about here, justice is that expression of gratitude. Gratitude in every way. Okay? He says, the mourn who does not recompense, or the man, sorry, who does not recompense his benefactor when he has it in his power, and when his benefactor needs his assistance, is no doubt guilty of the blackest ingratitude. The heart of every impartial uh, spectator rejects all fellow feelings, with the selfishness of his motives. And he is the proper object of the highest disapprobation. But still, he does no positive hurt to anybody. He only does not do that good which impropriety he ought to have done. So he says here, a selfish person who is, <clears throat> who is in a position to help other people but refuses to do it, of course this person, you know, does not hurt any other person. <clears throat> does not hurt anybody, but uh, there is something expected of this person that should have been done that this person is refusing to do. There's an expectation. Here he talks about justice as virtue. He says, there is, however, another virtue of which the observance is not left to the freedom of our own wills which may be ex extorted by force and of which the violation exposes to resentment and consequently to punishment. <clears throat> this virtue is justice. The violation of justice is injury. Again, he says, the violation of justice is injury. It does real and positive hurt to some particular persons from motives which are naturally disapproved of. So in a case of injustice, there is hurt. Injustice is a violation of justice. He says the person himself who, med who meditates on injustice is sensible of his and feels that force may with the utmost propriety be made use of, both by the person whom is about to injure and by others. So the person who perpetuates injustice knows, he's arguing, knows that they are about to hurt somebody. That they, are, they, they are about to cause harm. So it isn't that the person who perpetuates injustice is unaware of uh, the consequence of their policy, the consequence of the action. Oh, they know. That's what he's saying. So those who perpetuate injustice know that it is to hurt other people. And so what Adam Smith is saying here, what benefit is that if justice is designed to hurt? Furthermore, he says the notion of equality is based on justice, not force. That we feel ourselves to be under a stricter obligation to act according to justice, than agreeably to friendship, charity, and generosity, uh, that the practice of these last mentioned virtues seems to be left in the same measure to our own choice. But that, however, I mean, somehow or other, we feel ourselves to be in a peculiar manner tied, bound and obliged to the observation of no justice. He says in a case then when we refuse, okay, we refuse to be, uh, to walk in the generosity of justice. Then we know that it is not based on equality at all. Because equality cannot be perceived 
or generated by force cannot be acquired by force. He said a civil magistrate is entrusted with the power not only of preserving public peace, the public peace, by restraining injustice, but of promoting the prosperity of the Commonwealth, by establishing good discipline and by discouraging every sort of vice and impropriety. To neglect it altogether exposes the Commonwealth or the nation or society to gross disorder and shocking enormities. And to push it too far is destructive of all liberty, security, and justice. Okay? So Adam Smith is basically arguing here, if we're going to talk about justice and equality, it is important for us to understand the negation of it, that is, the opposite side. Because without justice, there is disorder. Okay? Without justice, there is no liberty, security at all. But he's not talking about mere justice here. Okay, it is not just mere justice. He says, mere justice is upon most occasion but a negative virtue. And only hinders us from hurting our neighbor. But what he's talking about here is this, this intentional notion of justice. We may often fulfill all the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing. That is, if we see something happen, we refuse to identify with it. But just responding to a person's plight or just responding to a situation, he is on the one hand saying it's not enough, but it's to take a, a particular action, an intentional action. Okay? Here he talks about the use of justice, the utility of justice. It is thus the man who can subsist only in society was fated by nature to, to that situation for which he was made. All the members of human society stand in need of each other's assistance and are likewise exposed to mutual injuries where the necessary assistance is re uh, reciprocally afforded from love, from gratitude, from friendship and esteem. And so the society flourishes and is happy. The utility of justice depends upon the expression, demonstration of gratitude, friendship, love, esteem for others. And so all the different members of it are bound together by the agreeable bonds of love and affection and are, and are as it were, drawn to one another, to one common center of mutual good offices. So. In that way, he, he turns now to society and says that society cannot prosper, okay, without justice. But though the necessary assistance should not be afforded from such generous and disinterested motive, though among the different members of society, there should be no mutual love and affection, the society, though less happy and agreeable, will not necessarily be dissolved. But society needs to strive upon justice. Okay, though society may not be destroyed for lack of justice, but society thrives on concepts of justice, equity, fairness, liberty, and security for all. He says society must subsist among other different, among different men, as among different merchants, from a sense of its utility without any mutual love or affection. And though no man in, in it should own any obligation or be bound in gratitude to any other, it may still be upheld by a mercenary exchange of good offices according to an agreed valuation. Basically what he says, we agree upon certain things. We agree that people need to be treated like this. That's justice. You see? But here again, he, 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 he brings in a, a, a contrary notion. That is, where injustice exists, where injustice exists, the very fabric of society crumbles. He says, society, however, cannot subsist among those who are at all time ready to hurt and injure one another. 
Society may subsist, though not in the most comfortable state without benevolence, but the prevalence of injustice must utterly destroy society. It's, the, this is, it's destructive. In a case where you find a lot of injustices, a lot of uh, hurtful situations and actions, policies and public policies and decisions, <clears throat> he's saying society crumbles. So, furthermore, he says he has just, uh, justice is the basis for social intercourse in the society, in the civil society. That is, for social interaction. He says, a society cannot subsist unless the laws of justice are tolerably observed. So no social intercourse can take place among men who do not generally abstain from injuring one another. The consideration of this necessity, it has been thought, was the ground upon which we approve of the enforcement of the laws of justice but the punishment of those who violated them. He says, so we have punishment because there are individuals who violate the laws of justice. Okay? The laws of justice who refuse to, uh, to walk accordingly, basically to, to walk in expected relationship with other people. As we come to the end of this, the question then is, what is justice for Adam Smith? What is justice for Adam Smith? Justice for Adam Smith and the contrary is the main pillar, he, <clears throat> he argues, that upholds the whole edifice. That is the whole edifice of society. If it is removed, the great, the immense fabric of human society, that fabric which to raise and support saints in this world, if I may say so, to have been the peculiar and darling care of nature must in a moment crumble into atoms. Basically what he's saying, if society thrives on injustice, it crumbles. Because justice becomes that great fabric, okay? That thing that holds society together, that supports society. And he argues here that nature even recognizes the importance of justice. But in the absence of justice, society crumbles. You see? So his notion of justice here again is very, very uh, psychosocial. That is, it, do, it, it, it is derived from our concept of relationship dealing with other people, putting oneself in that position, how would you expect to receive justice? To receive justice when injustice prevails. So he's saying, put yourself in a position of the person who is receiving injustice, who has been hurt. Put yourself in that position, okay? He said for that, in that case, the notion of adequate justice is minimized. It's not, it's not uh, uh, realistic. So that's uh, uh, Adam Smith again. He says, in order to enforce the observation of justice, therefore, nature has implanted in the human breast that consciousness of ill desert. Those terrors of merit of punishment which attend upon it violation and as the great safeguards of the, of the association of mankind to protect the weak, to curb the violent, and to chastise the guilty. So basically he's also saying here is that, what he's saying here is that justice is natural, injustice is unnatural. He says because there is an innate understanding of justice that is within us as human beings. Everyone in, understands what injustice is. And everyone understands what justice is. Okay? He says nature has implanted justice in the human breast. Within us, we know what injustice is. So, we've come to the, set, to the end of this uh, discussion, discussion four. 
I want you to think about the following questions. Unfortunately, we don't have the time uh, to discuss them, but I want you to think about the following questions. What do you think about Smith's definition of passion? Is there something called right, called right passion? Because for him, passion is the, is the ground. Right passion is the ground for justice. What prevents us from exhibiting right passion? Do we have the imagination to exhibit right passion? Are we declining in passion as a means of moral action? Or is passion an adequate means to heal society or civil society? Again, from the beginning, I indicated the fact that Smith's notion of justice is based on sympathy, passion. And in our next uh, discussion, we will highlight some of these things again. So let me just close the screen. Again, thank you very much for, for attending this session. My name is uh, Dr. George Walter Slayen. You've been listening to a discussion, our fourth discussion on Adam Smith's book, The uh, Theory of Moral Sentiment. And we've been talking about justice, sympathy, beneficence, that is the person who receives uh, a notion of justice and the concept of injustice as well. So it was a pleasure having you. And if you need to follow up on this, send me an email, go to my website, which is georgewalterslayon.com, georgewalterslayon.com. And uh, let's, we can stay in communication through that. Okay, thank you very much for being a part of this conversation on Facebook.